Welcome to the Dragon Slayer podcast by Frontier Credit Union. I am Stephen. With me, as always, is Bailey. And today's guest, Dr. Dustin Portella. Dr. Dustin, welcome. Hey, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I know you're really busy. In fact, you were just telling me that you've been uh, in front of a camera all day. Yep. What were you doing? So I was uh, participating in a new launch of skincare products for a brand. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can say them or not, but... If you um, want, yeah, yeah I mean, it's fine. They're, they're called Thayer's, and um, they launched a bunch of new acne products, and their target demographic is Gen Z. So I was meeting with a lot of beauty editors over Zoom meetings, kind of explaining the ingredients and everything, and kind of, you know, the the brand wants them to write stories about the products and mm -hmm. kind of get the news out there. And so I've learned a lot about how the media world works and how brands place product and how to how they get stories written and, and those kinds of things. So it was an interesting experience. Um kind of taking a deep dive because I have to do a lot of study and research and stuff yeah, to understand the products course. before then I go on. And I, I act on behalf of the brand to explain these from a dermatologist perspective to the beauty editors and help them understand. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're a dermatologist, mm -hmm. but you're not just a dermatologist. You're one of the most followed dermatologists probably in the world, actually, <laughs> uh, like really um, huge followings in social media. You're very well trusted very well thought of and respected in that space. Um, but I want to go back in time mm -hmm. and figure out how did you get to where you're at today? Yeah. So you mentioned that you grew up in Firth mm -hmm. and your dad was a science teacher and he was kind of the genesis of you being interested in, in science. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from the time I was a little kid, he was, you know, a science teacher and he, he coached every sport under the sun. And so I just spent my entire childhood at the high school mm. and I would follow him around to every basketball game. I rode the bus. I went everywhere. And when we weren't at a sport, we were in his classroom and I was taking out chemistry beakers and, you know, boiling water on the Bunsen burner. And then I'd look at the frogs that had been dissected and, you know, the skeletons and ev everything that he had. And I was just this little mad scientist, you know, <laughs> playing around, not knowing what I was doing. Yeah. But he, you know, he taught me a lot as we did that. And he would explain what the different chemicals w were for, what you could do with them. And he, you know, mix things together and you'd get an explosion. And he knew what he was doing. So it was all controlled. It mm -hmm. wasn't breaking bad stuff. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it really sparked a curiosity in me for, um, for science. And one of the things that he did is he really wanted to inspire a lot of kids to go into healthcare in one capacity or another. Mm. And so as part of his class, when I took it, and, and I even started going with him when I was in middle school, he took the kids and set up a, a program with Idaho State University where in high school they started going to the cadaver lab at the end of the semester oh, wow. so that high school kids could get exposure to what the human body looks like. And you'd go through these cadavers and you'd look at, you know, what was the possible cause of death here? Um, you would take a field trip to the funeral home to see what, wow. what does a funeral director and a mortician do. We'd go visit physical therapists. We'd talk to doctors. He'd bring them into the class. So he really wanted to translate the principles of learning science, anatomy, and physiology, and chemistry into professional careers. Because for a lot of kids growing up in a small town where it's, you know, very blue collar, right. you know, it was a great way. And I, I would say that on a per capita basis, the classes that he taught have produced more health professionals than probably, you know, up against any science classroom in, in the country. Yeah, I bet that's right. I mean, it, just you describing all of that, I wouldn't do any of that stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's so wild. That's really, really neat. Okay, so at a young age, you're exposed to all kinds mm -hmm. of interesting things. At what point did you make the decision, I think I want to be a famous doctor? Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the famous part came later. At first, I had to decide just to become a doctor. Yeah. I went to Idaho State for undergrad. You know, uh, They have a good track record of you know health professions programs. They've got nursing. They've got dental hygiene. And and my dad went there. I had some of the same professors he did. And I uh, I, I kind of thought I would go to PA school oh, uh -huh. when I went into college and, uh, you know, vacillated on a lot of different things. But um, as I started to explore more, I was worried about the time commitment that medical school would take. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day somebody told me, well, you're going to be 35 someday anyway. Uh, yeah. And I'm like, that's a good point. The time's going to go by. Either way. Yeah. And I, I kind of just over time felt that my personality um wouldn't may, maybe fit as well as a PA. Mm. And I work with great PAs. I think it's a wonderful profession. But in, you have in to what do. sense? In what sense? Like, what about your personality did you I feel just, like wasn't right? Um, just 
not not knowing at all, not mm. being able to really have to be considered a master of a discipline. Mm. Um, whereas PA, it's a shorter period of school mm -hmm. and they're very much taught to be a generalist and they can get specialty education, but they're still never going to have the mastery that a physician has mm -hmm. on something. Mm -hmm. And as I was debating all of that, my roommate was planning to go to medical school and he was like unwavering. He's going to medical school. And uh, I'm sitting there looking at him and I'm like, and if Dan can do it, I can do it. <laughs> and, and Dan is a smart guy. He's a radiation oncologist now. He trained at the Mayo Clinic, like brilliant guy. Yeah, and but he was just Dan, your roommate at the time. He was just time. Dan, my yeah, roommate yeah, at the time, yeah. <laughs> I went to high school with him, you know, all this stuff. And so on, uh, on Sundays, a lot of times I'd study uh, through the afternoon, and then I'd hit up this Chinese place in Pocatello, and I'd get some Chinese food and, and then kind of call it a day. And no joke, one day I'm sitting there eating Chinese on a Sunday afternoon, somewhere early in my junior year and I opened the fortune cookie at the end of the meal oh my gosh <laughs> and the fortune said you could prosper in the field of medicine what that's wild <laughs> it was like the most oddly specific thing and I was like that's really interesting I taped that is it, wild I took it home and I, I taped it to my study desk and I'm like <laughs> I guess I'm going to medical school <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah usually those fortune cookies are like do a good turn daily. Yeah. Like it's stuff like that. Yes. You'll enjoy yeah. travel. That's you know? right. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. That's wild. Oh my gosh. What, so, what Chinese restaurant was it? I couldn't even remember yeah, the name now. It was like there. on 4th Street in Pocatello. Okay, it's it was like... definitely Ming's. I've been there and they have good fortunes. They totally <laughs> well, do. what's so wild about you are the only person I've ever met that the fortune cookie fortune came true. Yeah, yeah true. That true. is wild. Yeah. That's wild. So I still have it to this day. It was taped to my study desk all through medical school. And then that desk fell apart. And I, I taped it to the inside of my wallet. And the wallet has since fallen apart. But, like, I still have it on my dresser at home. Like, I'm keeping that forever. That's so wild. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Golly. Okay. So then what? What so, happens next? So I go to medical school. Yeah. I went to Des Moines University in Iowa beautiful campus, great education. And I really, you know, I worked hard in school. I knew that um, I wanted to specialize in something. And dermatology, I had shadowed in dermatology. Mm -hmm. And I had some interest in it. But when you shadow in different specialties, you get a very different perspective on it. And so when you shadow in dermatology, you're kind of standing in the corner. Nobody wants some shadow med student to touch their face or anything. Like you're not injecting <laughs> Botox. You don't get a help with the procedures and you're just standing there watching. And, and honestly, it can be boring if you're just shadowing. Yeah. And then I would shadow in the ER and they'd have, you know, 100 patients in the waiting room. And they're like, hey, I need you to do this. I need you to do this. And, and you're like, you're involved, you're active. And you're mm. like, ER is fun. Mm -hmm. So I went into medical school thinking I'm going to be an ER doctor. Mm -hmm. So I joined the ER club and I'm like, yeah, I'll join the Durham club too. I love that there's an ER club. Yeah. In medical. Awesome. Of course there is. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. there's a club for everything, <laughs> uh, every specialty. And so, you know, I wanted to do well in school because I knew like, Durham was super competitive. ER also was competitive, but I didn't want to go to like a bottom of the rung ER program. Mm -hmm. I was going to go to like, I wanted to go to, you know, Cook County, Chicago or something right. like oh, Detroit Mercy. I want the knife and gun club. Jeez, I want to see yeah. it all. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted the best training wherever I could be at. And so um, as I started to learn more about the different specialties, and again, I, I like to explain it as 30 year old me and 50 year old me sat down and had a conversation. Mm about what we wanted to do when we were 50. And 30 year old me is like, nights, weekends, I can work anything, I can see the crazy stuff, I can go no sleep for 36 hours, whatever it takes, like this is fun. And 50 year old me is like, pump the brakes there, <laughs> cowboy. Like, you know, maybe you don't wanna work weekends forever, you know, you don't wanna do those night shifts, you don't wanna miss Christmas or a kid's birthday because you mm -hmm. got a shift. And so I, I knew that you got to do a lot of procedures in dermatology, and that's what really drew me to ER mm. is the hands-on. Mm. And I decided that, that derm would give me, uh, with my personality, a more fulfilling life in the long run mm. with more work-life balance, family flexibility. 
Um, but it was the most competitive specialty. And everybody tells you, like, unless your uncle is, like, the derm department chair at the hospital, like, you're not getting in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I just decided that wasn't going to be my fate. And, mm-hmm. and I was going to do everything possible to get into a derm program. And I was fortunate enough that, you know, that's a whole other long story how it worked out. But it did work out. And I was able to train at, at a great derm program. Hmm. That's really interesting. So it's the most, it's among the most competitive specialties. Is, yeah. So why is it? so competitive so work-life balance is huge yeah there's very few emergencies in dermatology right. so we really don't take a lot of hospital call uh, there are people who prefer to work in the hospital more um, but you do a lot of procedures and there are i mean there's challenges in our medical system nobody needs to be told that but in general if you practice medicine you are rewarded for doing procedures you're not mm. rewarded for thinking And that's why some of our most important specialties, like pediatrics, they just don't do a lot of procedures, but it's a critical role. Family Mm -hmm. medicine, critical role. Uh, Psychiatry, you know, uh, internal medicine. There's just not a lot of procedures Mm -hmm. that they do in those specialties. They do a lot of thinking and they do incredible work, but they're not financially rewarded for that the way that you are if you can crank out procedures. Right. And so that's why orthopedic surgeons are among the highest paid specialists. Mm -hmm. Dermatology does get remunerated quite well. And so I can have good work-life balance. I can make a better income that will provide for my family. And overall, I'll be happier. But it's because of those reasons that it's, you know, those high-paying specialties where you do a lot of procedures tend to be the most competitive. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Um, Okay, so you get done with medical school. What's next? So I finished medical school, and now I'm, I'm trying to match into a dermatology residency. Mm-hmm. The, there, are, there are two ways to become a physician in the United States. You can go to a DO school, Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine, or you can go to an MD school, which is a Doctor of Medicine. Just like in dentistry, there's DDS and DMD. Mm. So the MD side, you finish medical school and you match into a derm program. You have to do a traditional medical year first where you're just, again, learning all of the breadth of medicine, and then you do three years specializing in dermatology. But you get your assignment in your fourth year of med school for all four years. Hmm. At the time that I went through on the DO side, you could not apply to a derm residency until you were an intern. And so I applied for internships not knowing what was going to happen after that year. So it was a big gamble because there's way more applicants than there are spots. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I was trying to match at a hospital that also had a derm program because I figured I can get FaceTime, I can help the derm residents, I can brown nose the program director, (laughs) whatever it takes, I'm going to write papers, I'm going to try to get in. Yeah. And so I had met um, some of these residents at a program I was interested in at conferences, and I had worked remotely to help them write papers and publish in journals. And I had definitely expressed my interest in getting the internship. And the dermatology program got to select one of the interns at the hospital. And so I'm, I'm in my fourth year of medical school, and the hospital takes a few of us to go talk to the medical school down in Ohio, Um, and so I'm there just, you know, teaching people how to suture, whatever it is. And one of the residents texts me and he's like, Hey, are you coming to the interview today? Uh, And this is up in Michigan. And I'm like, no, I didn't get an invite. (laughs) Like what's going on? And he's like, oh, we were doing interviews today and you're not here. And I'm like, I never got, I never got an interview invitation. And he's like, hold on, let me check. So he calls me later that night and I'm like, broken inside. Oh, I was like, this yeah. was my program. Oh my gosh. I put all my chips on the table to get in here. And so he calls me and what happened is that um, the Durham residents went through all the applicants and they selected 12 people that they thought would be good candidates to interview. And then they gave those to one of the, the attending doctors in the program and she felt that she didn't have time to interview 12 and she randomly shuffled the deck, took six oh my goodness. and I wasn't in there. Oh my goodness. So I'm like heartbroken. <laughs> And um, I'm like, I'm supposed to come and rotate with you guys in like a month. Like, should I even show up? Is it worth it? And he's like, yeah, just come. You never know what can happen. And so I go there and I'm, you know, spending time with the program director. I spend a day with each of the different doctors. And the the resident that had, you know, talked to me at the conference and everything, you know, he, he was kind of trying to look out for me. He was making suggestions like, hey, I think this guy'd be really good. And then I got to know one of the other residents and he was doing the same thing. So the day that I went with their surgeon that was doing all the skin cancer surgery, 
you know, I start uh, working with him, watching him suture. I'm helping with the surgery. I'm blotting for blood and everything. And he starts quizzing me like on, you know, dermatology terms and, and conditions. And, and I was prepped for it. I'd studied a lot. So I was getting his questions right. And then he's like, oh, where'd you grow up? And I'm like, oh, I grew up in, you know, Idaho. And he's like, oh, really? What part? And I was like, oh, Firth. And where do you go to undergrad? Idaho State. And he's like, no kidding. That's where I went. Mm. And I was like, oh, really? And he's like, yeah, I'm from Mountain Home. Wow. And I was like, oh, what, you know, you're out here in Michigan. He's like, yeah, I just decided to stay here. I did my residency here. And then we start talking about like, who were your professors in college? And we had some of the same professors. And so then it turns into an interview while we're there. And he starts asking me like all the typical interview questions. And I'm like, this seems good. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah. Could and be worse. Uh, so it's my last day in the, um, on the rotation and, uh, the chief resident comes up to me and he just holds up a paper and it's a list of names. And I know some of the names cause there are other medical students mm -hmm. that I know are competing for Durham and my name's at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what is that? And he goes, it's our match list. And I was like, I have the spot. And he's like, you got the spot. Wow. And I was like, Oh my gosh. So like showing up and just giving it your best, even though the circumstances seemed not in my favor yeah. really played out. So I got the internship spot. I busted my butt for another year and then I applied and matched into the Durham program. Wow. So, and I, I have to say that like the person that I knocked off the list, <laughs> she became a dermatologist and she doesn't know this story. I've never told her. I was going to say, she, can you share with us the names on that list? Yeah. <laughs> so the person that missed that spot did end up getting a Durham residency as well. So I, I didn't feel bad i would have felt bad if she'd never become a dermatologist <laughs> she's working at a car wash in yeah. detroit now yeah oh my Several. gosh that's so funny yeah uh, that's wild okay so I, great advice in there too yeah. like just even when the circumstances aren't perfect you just get out there and you give it all you got anyway right. that's some of the best advice i've heard in a really really long time because i think the reality is when are the circumstances ever really perfect? Right. Uh, basically never. No. Right. And a lot of people self-select themselves out of success. Yeah. Because they say, eh, it looks hard. It looks hard. Yeah. And, and if they find somebody else that they can put the blame on, mm -hmm. then they don't have to take responsibility so, for it. Yeah, so true. And it's, it's easy if, if you can offset that blame and then play the victim, and it, you're just not going to be successful if you get in the habit of doing that. Yeah. I mean, you never see winners that blame other people for right. what's going on in their lives. Yeah. Just, it's not a thing. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Okay. So what's next? All right. <laughs> so I'm finishing up uh, my residency and it's time to look for a job. My program director wants me to stay and work for him. I don't want to stay in Michigan. Uh, I want to come back to Idaho. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at, can I set up my own practice? That seemed really daunting. And one day I'm just sitting in a lecture and I'm scrolling like job boards and a job pops up in Boise, Idaho. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, let's look at that. And it's like looking for a young dermatologist who wants to do a lot of surgery, who would like to take over the practice of a retiring physician. And I'm like, that is me. Mm -hmm. And so I send an email while I'm sitting there in lecture and they get right back to me and they're like, wow. when do you want to fly out? We'd love to interview you. And so before I finish, before I'm out of that lecture, I essentially got a flight booked to come <laughs> back here to Boise. <laughs> and there, there was a phenomenon going on in the dermatology world at this time where private equity groups were buying dermatology yeah. practices, consolidating them for cost savings, and then eventually they'd flip it on to a bigger buyer. Right. And so I knew that if there is a retiring dermatologist, private equity is going to try to buy their practice. Yeah, of course. So when I came out, um, I showed up to the clinic, and I won't name the clinic, um, probably because I'd get sued or something. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> And so I showed up to the clinic at 8, and by 11 o'clock, the doctor hands me a contract and asks if I'd like to sign. And I was like, this seems great, but I'm definitely going to have my attorney look over this. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, of course, yeah. And so I give it to my attorney. Um, we add in a bunch of stuff yeah. because I did want to buy this practice. Mm -hmm. I was committed to growing it and seeing it be more successful than it was. It was well-established. Then I returned the contract with the amendments that – prohibited them from selling to private equity and had mm -hmm. an agreed upon price and a sales date. And so I had a really solid contract. And then I started the job after I graduated residency. And by that time, private equity had approached them oh, and goodness, made yeah. an offer, but they were legally bound to my agreement. Right. It created a lot of tension because they could afford to pay the doctor a lot more than I could for the practice. 
And so he was trying to find ways to get out of the contract, and there was a lot of tension. And I, I and really, his name again was yeah. I'm just kidding, yeah. <laughs> and so I really thought that I was going to get fired. Um, I'd been working for like two weeks at this point, oh my gosh. and the only out that he had legally from the contract was to fire me without cause. And I, I just remember going home to my wife and being like, "I'm going to lose my job. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what we're going to do." You know, mm-hmm. I bought a house, I refinanced my student loans, like. This is not good. Yeah. And um, he didn't fire me. We just kept going back and forth and he'd propose new contracts and I would say no. <laughs> like, I'm not going to sign a contract that's worse than what I have. And eventually, like, there was just so much tension at work. Uh, they weren't happy. I was miserable. And, and so I asked my attorney to draft a termination agreement. Mm-hmm. And I said, I think we just need to get out of here. Mm-hmm. And I want to make sure that I'm protected as I do that. Um, he's never going to be happy selling the clinic to me and he wants to stay on and work. This is just not going to be a good relationship and I'm going to make the best of this bad situation. And so we agreed to terminate the contract in a, in 120 days and that I would have no non-compete or non-solicitation agreement mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. patients or employees. Yep. Um, once I was no longer employed, they, they agreed to that because they wanted to sell the private equity and more, more than happy for them to do that. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, the day we signed that, I went to work trying to figure out how am I going to start a clinic, where am I going to be at, and I probably spent four months running on two hours of sleep a night oh boy. Yeah. Um, working with bankers and realtors, and I was able to set up and open my own clinic um, a month after I had left that job. Wow, so, that's fast, too. So we opened Treasure Valley Dermatology in uh, March of 2018 Mm -hmm. and um, have had really great success in that we've grown the practice now to three locations and a brand new building and uh, the other practice is you know still in business I have not spoken to the doctor since I hope that he's happy I hope things are working out well for them did they ever sell to private equity they did they They sold to private equity yeah so well, um, and and I, okay. I don't have any hard feelings for him because yeah. I don't think I'd be in the position I am today if I hadn't been forced to grind so hard to succeed because mm-hmm. I had my family, I had loans, I had all of this stuff, and I was determined that I was going to succeed. And I was able to hire some good employees that really um, set me up for success as well, that bought into the dream and the yeah. mission that we were trying to build. I wonder, have you ever considered, like, had things gone differently mm-hmm. and you would have purchased that practice and you would have just kept going with that. Have you ever considered how that would be different from the situation you're in today? You know, a little bit, but, um, I don't spend a ton of time thinking about it, but I, I would do a lot of the same stuff I'm doing, but I, I don't know that I would have dove into social media the way that I have. I I wonder if the path you ended up on actually ended up being much better for you. I completely believe it it was. Because I think it probably pushed you into some stuff that like social media, which has gone tremendously well for yeah. you mm-hmm. coming into like an established place you probably wouldn't have been pushed into doing some of that right, stuff yeah. and you would have missed a lot i think mm-hmm. that's really fascinating actually you know i was talking to somebody the other day and they were telling me about just a setback they'd had in their career and and um i, I couldn't help but think like yeah that that's a thing that happens to people mm-hmm. right i don't know a single human being alive that's career has gone perfectly the way that they wanted it to right. the way they had planned it out when they were in school or whatever. And, um, I, I just believe that like that particular setback that they're going through is just going to be good for them at yeah. some stage. Mm-hmm. And I think that's true of a lot of people actually, as long as you keep going. Yeah. Right. As long as you don't give up and get depressed and everything else. And if you keep going, it's so good for you. Yeah. 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 Take ownership of the situation. Yeah. And just keep mm-hmm. going. That's fascinating. Okay, so so you start this practice. It's gone remarkably well. Mm-hmm. At what point do you say, I need to get into some social media? At Frontier Credit Union, we're changing the future of business with our Velocity Money Market account. You can receive unbeatable returns on tiered interest rates. We have rates up to 2.02% APY. Frontier Credit Union puts local businesses first because when you do better, we all do better. Federally insured by the NCUA. So you start this practice, it's gone remarkably well. Mm -hmm. At what point do you say, I need to get into some social media? Yeah. I, um, when we did our open house 
for the practice. We'd been open a month or so and kind of had the, the kinks worked out. So we, we hosted an open house and somebody suggested to me to bring one of the local influencers in to promote yeah, the open sure, house. Yeah. And, and I was like, oh, that's a good idea. Mm-hmm. And well, you know, I didn't have any money at the time. I wasn't paying myself yet. Right. So I just messaged this influencer. Um, it's, her name's Natalie. She runs the account Hello Meridian. Mm-hmm. And, we know uh, Natalie. Yeah. 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 So love Natalie. Great friend. And uh, I was like, hey, I'm opening a Durham office. I would love to bring you to our open house. Like, I don't know how this works. Like, <laughs> what do I pay you or, or anything? And mm-hmm. she she says, yeah, I can come to your open house. I don't work with any dermatologists, so this you know would fit with us. And it's going to be X amount of dollars. And um, it, to me, it was like, how am I going to afford that? Mm-hmm. And it was not a lot of money. Like she was, yeah. she was not charging a lot of money. But I had yeah. no, no but money when, at the when time. When you have no yeah. money, any money feels like a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, you know, I'm going to do it. And so she came. She promoted us and uh, ended up becoming a good friend. But over the next like month, the number of people that came into the clinic, and I was like, how do you hear about us? And I'm like, oh, I saw you on Hello Meridian. Mm-hmm. And it was like. Mm-hmm. That was definitely worth it. Mm -hmm. Uh, We more than made up for that investment. And so I hired Natalie to run our social media for the practice for a little while. And then I started researching and reading. And I read Gary Vee's book, Crushing It, on, uh, you know, how to build a brand on social media. Because I was like, this is free advertising if you can grow on social media. Mm -hmm. And in his book, he said that you needed to be on TikTok. If you wanted to build a personal brand, that was going to be the next big thing. Yeah. So I downloaded TikTok. I opened it and I was like, this is weird. <laughs> what, so what year is this? That this, this was is 2019. 2019. Yeah, by this God. point. It's a good time to get That's into like TikTok. That's like brand new yeah. TikTok. So yeah. it was like yeah. summer 2019. Um, I read the book. I opened TikTok. And the algorithm didn't know anything about my interests <laughs> at the time. So it's serving me all these videos. And I'm like, this is not for me. Mm-hmm. And I closed it. And I didn't open it again for like six months. Mm-hmm. And then one day, another friend of mine who's a local influencer, like, messaged me. She's like, I have a video going viral on TikTok. And I was like, oh, cool. I'll check it out. Send me the link. So she sends me the link. And it's a video of her recording her facial expressions as she got a Brazilian wax. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like, you know, half half a million views at this point. And I was like, all right, I might want to try this. So I scheduled a Brazilian. (laughs) No, just kidding. <laughs> so I started I started just posting videos that I had on my phone and like they did nothing and I was like this is not going well. At, at that point were you like I'm just going to post whatever. Just whatever. Yeah. Like I didn't do any research into like how to succeed mm-hmm. on the platform. Mm-hmm. And so then one day like I'm scrolling through TikTok and I'm recognizing that people are using one particular sound over and over on all these videos. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And it was a sound that had gunshots and they're usually cleaning their mirror. They're like spraying Windex and they're cleaning their mirror. And I was like, I don't want to clean a mirror, but I have a liquid nitrogen gun. (laughs) And so I queued up that sound and um, I, I got a couple staff members in there. And I was like, how we treat warts as a dermatologist. And I take the nozzle off so it sprays a ton of liquid nitrogen. And I walk into the sound and I'm like, guns a blazing. Uh And I was like, oh, that was fun. And I posted it. And then when we went to the company Christmas party, and then like at the end of the Christmas party, they're like, oh, how's that video doing? And I was like, I don't know, let me see. And I opened it up and I was like, 25,000 views. Wow. It's been just a couple hours. That's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 And so I was like, ah, that's awesome. And then by, you know, two days later, I'm like, oh, it's at 400,000. And then it ends up going over a million, and I was like, I'm hooked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just started, um, po- like, researching sounds and then putting a dermatology twist on it, mm-hmm. and they just kept going viral. I was, like, one of the first derms on the platform, and my follower count was, like, 25,000 within a month, and it just grew exponentially from there. Wow. So it really started with TikTok. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. It, that's such a fascinating platform, mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. It is, um, golly, it's like free basing dopamine, oh, right? Yeah. Like, cause you just <laughs> get addicted. Oh, I like that. I like that. I like that yep. too. Yeah. yeah. It's so wild. Yeah. Um, so what was your like best video? What was the one that you were like, this is yeah. my pride and joy. I've had two that have done like over 30 million. Holy cow. Um, one of them, lots. one of them was just me draining this giant cyst. <laughs> Those are so satisfying. Uh, People love that stuff. People either love it or hate it. Yeah. Yeah. And then on another one, um, I was bit by a horse. (laughs) I was feeding an apple to a horse, and then one of the other horses wanted the apple, so he, like, lunged Mm -hmm. for it and then got my thumb. 
and I had to do surgery the next day and I like my thumb was just throbbing <laughs> I had a I had a big hematoma under the nail mm-hmm. and so I got one of our hot tip cautery units oh my god and I like I gave the phone to one of my assistants I was like I want you to record this and so I just explained like I have a hematoma and then I like get this hot poker and red hot and I just tap the nail and the blood comes out and uh, that one went super viral <laughs> So they're like <laughs> gross stuff, but I've had a lot of others that are just educational and stuff. And, yeah. and so I found that, you know, you can, you, you give people what they want and then you like sprinkle in the education. That's right. Yeah. 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 So. No, I think that's exactly the way to do it. Okay. Tell me about a video that when you shot it, you were like, this is going to kill. And then it flopped. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have way more videos that flop than are successful, but you know, you can, you can spend a lot of time planning and like cut these different scenes and everything. And, uh, I don't know that I have a specific example, but, um, you know, you just put a lot of work into something and then it's not rewarded. And then sometimes you just do something off the cuff and you're like, it just goes big. Yeah. So, yeah. It's one of those things that it's like, there is a science to it a little bit. There's an Mm -hmm. art to it a little bit. But then there's just some luck yeah. involved in it too. Totally. totally. It's like, does the algorithm pick it up or not? Mm-hmm. And yeah. you can only Time control so much yeah. of that. Yeah. So you opened the practice in was it twenty eighteen? Is it what you said? Twenty eighteen. Yeah. Golly, that is such exponential growth in a really a mm-hmm. short period of time. Yeah. You know, we're six years and you're up to three practices. Mm-hmm. That sounds hard. That sounds like that was just a lot of work. Yeah. What was some of the biggest struggles that you had as you built that? Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they say when you have people, you'll have people problems. Yeah, mm-hmm. sure. And, um, you know, managing employees is a challenge and I have great employees, but I, I have so much respect for my employees yeah. and they have their own families, they have their own needs mm-hmm. and, um, their own schedules. And so, you know, I, I pay for their health insurance and I, I think that in the economy today, just making sure that my employees are taken care of, that is a big challenge. Our overhead has grown by at least 16% um, over the last couple of years. Oof. And so yeah. that you know that's a huge struggle because our reimbursements haven't gone up. Right. And that is one of the reasons that I am really glad to be on social media is that when I sit there and I look at the you know profit and loss statements and uh, employee requests for raises and all these things, and we try to be reasonable and expect the employees to be reasonable. Mm-hmm. But I can also say that, like, look, these are good employees and I want to keep them. And if I can generate revenue on social media, this does not have to hit me as hard. Yeah. Because any money that I have to pay out of the practice is money that doesn't come to me. Right. And so, you know, making sure that I have good employees that take good care of the patients that we that we have the privilege to serve. That's by far the biggest challenge. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um you know, so we've got good employees that understand the mission of what we're trying to do. Um, but I want to make sure that they're happy working for us all the time. Yeah. And it's hard to keep everybody happy all the time. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, in medical school, do they talk about running a practice, like the business side of running a none, practice? None whatsoever. Yeah. So where do you pick that stuff up as a medical professional? So, I mean, I did a lot of reading. Um, I've always been interested in business, so podcasts and books. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to go to the specific residency program that I went to is that the program director was a very successful businessman. Yeah. It was primarily a a community-based dermatology program run mostly out of private practices. And we would rotate at the big academic hospitals for pediatrics and stuff. Mm -hmm. But every day that we went in, we were working in a practice that had to be profitable. Yeah. And so I got to see the way that he made business decisions, both good and bad, mm-hmm. and learn from them over the course of three years. Um, I ended up being the chief resident and was trusted with a lot of information and a lot of advice and, and time counseling with him. And when I was going through the whole process of leaving my practice and, um, you know, starting my own, I, I was able to call him a whole bunch yeah, and just say, nice. what, what would you do? How do you do this? And so that was a big help to me is just having mentors that yeah. um, wanted you to succeed. Yeah, that's so interesting. That uh, do, do you feel like maybe that system doesn't necessarily set people up to be successful doing it, or is there a gap there? In 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 general, in, like in, t- in teaching a medical professional, yeah, because they end up becoming these business owners, yeah, 
very frequently. It's not as frequent as I as I wish it was yeah, sure. that they yeah. could be business owners, yeah. and I, there's a huge educational gap there. Yeah, and part of me, you know, thinks it's intentional because the insurance system, mm. the hospital administrators, all of these things, they they want to make money too. Right, and we have middlemen in there with pharmacy benefit managers. And if you have a bunch of doctors coming out who understand business and can mm-hmm. run their own practice, they're not going to go work for the hospitals as frequently. And they're not going to become cogs in the wheel for this giant medical machine that, right. that drives so much profit for so many people. And so uh, there's not a lot of incentive in the system hmm. to teach doctors to be better at business. Interesting. Very interesting. So going back to your comment before about um, people. hmm building the right kind of team. Yeah. How do you make sure that you do that at your practice? This is something I, I won't even claim that I've been great at it all the time because <laughs> they, I get a lot of distractions with social media and I travel a bunch. And so from the very beginning, I still have my core employees. They've mm-hmm. been with me since day one. Wow. Um, so my nurse, my office manager, front desk manager, and then two or three medical assistants. And if everything went sideways and they stayed with me, uh, I knew that we would will always be successful. Mm-hmm. I try to lead by example. Um, the way that I care for patients, the way that I speak to patients, and the extra things that I do to try to make patients happy, they see that. Uh, I model that for them. And then we have frequent meetings about what are the challenges. Do we have an unhappy patient? What happened? How can we make sure that doesn't happen again? Mm-hmm. And we try to establish that culture that I think has come from them just as much as it's come from me. And we understand where we started at when we just had like four of us. Hmm. And so when it comes time to hire, you know, I get to meet everybody. But ultimately, the decision to hire somebody at the front desk, I'm going to lean on their expertise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they know if this person's going to be a good culture fit and if they have the skills to take care of the patients the way that we want to. And that medical assistant, do they have the the skills and the compassion to treat patients Mm -hmm. the way that we have established in the practice. So, you know, it's just trusting each other and Mm -hmm. modeling that and then watching them model it back. And I've learned from them as much as they've learned from me. That's interesting. I I had this one CEO that I worked for and the way he liked to do interviews is he said, I want you to evaluate the technical skill. Yeah. Can they do the job? Can they do it well? Yeah. And then he said, but I want to interview every single person, I don't care what the job is, mm-hmm. um, to evaluate, are they a good cultural fit for our business? Yeah. And we had a thousand employees and he was doing this. He interviewed every single person there. And we were, I don't know, I bet, I bet he spent 20 hours a week on interviews mm-hmm. just to evaluate cultural fit. Yeah. And th- now there's flaws to that sure. system, right? Like that it became very difficult because you're like, I really need to hire this person and I can only get on your calendar like in four months yeah. right, to do it. But um, what it did do is it created a really consistent cultural kind of application across the whole company. Mm-hmm. So you feel like a thousand people all kind of that fit into this cultural mold. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the ways he did it. it was really, really interesting and I don't know that I'd recommend anybody do it either, but it's because <laughs> yeah. it was really a pain to deal with too. But uh, it made him feel really, really comfortable that he was getting the right kinds of people in the building. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you were going to give a doctor starting their own practice mm-hmm. advice about here's how to build that team, you talk yeah. about that core group. How do you get the core? Yeah. How does that work? I mean, it, it's hard. It, it's going to be the hardest thing that you do. You already know how to take care of patients. Mm-hmm. You know medicine. And and so you have to kind of overcome that desire to control everything. A lot of doctors are going to be type A. And yeah. you just have to realize you're not going to control everything. Yeah. And so it's going to take some trial and error. But, you know, they say that it's easier to not hire somebody than to fire them. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. you know, it's worth taking the time, checking the references and you know, really understanding where that person comes from. It was probably easier for me than for a lot of people because many of the people I hired, I had worked with at my first job. Mm -hmm. And when I um, was able to announce that I was opening a clinic, most of them asked me for a job. Mm -hmm. They wanted to come with me. And Mm -hmm. so 
they had already worked with me in some capacity. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are, you know, starting a dermatology practice, you want to find an office manager that has experience in medicine and it might make somebody upset, but you might want to poach them from another office. (laughs) (laughs) But it's going to be so difficult for you to train them how to do billing uh, when you don't know how to do billing. Right. Yeah. And so you need to pay them well. Um, I, I do feel like I pay my employees well and they work hard for me, but ultimately this is your thing and you want them to have the vision and the mission, but it's not their thing. Yeah. And so you have to compensate them well. You have to be understanding when they need time off, when family things come up. We have employees that have kids, and we're, we try to be so understanding. When you got sick kids, I understand. We're going to try to make it work today because you can't come in. And um, if you if you don't treat them like a human being and you expect that they're going to have the same commitment to your business and your bottom dollar, you'll be disappointed. So you, you have to understand that they're they're working a job yeah and uh to the degree that you can get them to buy into the vision that's great Mm -hmm. but it's not their thing ultimately it's still just your thing and it's going to be a challenge that you'll face from time to time yeah yeah i think you're right a lot of founders have this issue yeah where they want people to be just as committed as Mm -hmm. they are which is really silly actually like why why in the world would they be yeah they don't get clearly don't take the same amount of risk but they don't get the same amount of reward right um, it's not theirs. Mm-hmm. They're just, they're not doing it for their health, yeah. right? They do it because they have to do it. But yeah, it's an interesting problem that a lot of people face and deal with. Back to social media. I'm curious. So for people who are trying to grow their business on social media yeah. and they're posting, they're doing all the things and they're feeling really discouraged because they haven't seen mm-hmm. the growth. What advice would you give them? You should try to get a little bit better with every video that you post and you're going to, Um, want to try new things you have to be willing to get out of your comfort zone Um, when I when I was in high school if you told me that I'd be putting on silly wigs and and getting in front of the camera I'd be like you're ridiculous I want nothing to do with theater acting music like I was just an athlete in high school I was like I don't even want to be in band anymore Um, and and so as I got into social media you know it kind of awakened a a creativity that I didn't Mm. know that I had And, you know, so I tried a lot of different things and found that certain things worked and certain things didn't. And there's a lot of gurus on social media who are going to tell you like, oh, do these things and use these hashtags. And um, unless they're doing it themselves consistently, like I get DMs all the time, like, hey, I want to help you with your social media. And I'll look at their profile, like you have 200 followers. (laughs) Like, I don't don't know what you're going to do for me. Yeah, I'm good. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, And so... You want to try new things. You don't want to just directly copy what somebody else is doing, but you want to look at how they're doing what they're doing. How do they introduce their videos? Mm. How do they keep people's attention? What makes you go back and want to keep watching their content? And how can you model that? And then you're still not going to do well for a long time. In most (laughs) cases, you have to be persistent with it. Because there are so many stories of people on social media who just stick with it. And we perceive them to be an overnight success. Mm -hmm. But they spent 10 years building a brand before something clicked. And they got the right break, the right opportunity, the right viral video. That now they're a household name. And you, you just have to be patient and continue to produce content. Because it could be the next video. Mm -hmm. And if you don't make that video you're never going to know it's so interesting we we interviewed a big youtube star Mm -hmm. on this podcast a while back and she'd posted videos for like eight years yeah before anything hit Mm -hmm. Uh, then i then you know overnight success right (laughs) you know that yeah it's really interesting it's a great point you Mm -hmm. just have to be persistent on it not give up on it yeah did you know, I thought you had another no. question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not at the moment. <laughs> so um, if you were going to give one big piece of advice mm-hmm. to somebody, not necessarily a doctor, but just somebody starting a business, yeah, what would be the advice? I, I feel that you need to have some purpose behind what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, plenty of people have run a business that they didn't have a personal interest in and still been successful with it. I have, um, you know, a cousin and... Um, MBA and and bought like a septic company. Um, But it's a business. 
and they know how to make money and that's great but i it's not like I was gonna i'm say passionate that's a about business, yeah. but yeah it's, <laughs> it's not something that they're passionate about yeah. but they want to run a business and grow it and probably sell it but mm-hmm. um i just think that if you have a purpose behind doing what you're doing you're going to be able to get through those hard times better and you're going to push through and you're going to find ways to be um, creative and have ingenuity behind solving those problems because you have a bigger purpose behind what you're doing mm. and you will not let it fail. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. I've heard people give advice that's like, be dispassionate about your business, mm-hmm. right? Like you don't want to get emotionally involved in it. Right. And it's an interesting take on it. I've just my own experience from what I've seen people that really care about what they're doing. You can see it. Yeah. Like you can see it in their eyes. You can see it in the way that they do things. They just are different Mm -hmm. in how they approach their business because they really do genuinely care about what they're doing. Yeah. Um, And I think there's lots of ways to skin the cat, right? Like you can do it all kinds of different ways, but it is interesting to watch people who really, really care about what they do. Yeah. Because, the late nights don't bother them. Yeah. The weekends don't bother them if they've got to work on it. Yeah. You know, if they're they're up in the middle of the night, they're doing research on the thing, which they would be doing anyway, even if they didn't have the business. Yeah. Like those people are so interesting. Yeah. And in how they approach what they do. Yeah. I, I mean, after uh, during college, I was a server for a little bit, hated it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I had no passion for that, and mm-hmm. so when I got scheduled for a night or a weekend, I was like, I freaking hate this yeah. job. <laughs> I just, I hate every moment being here and Mm -hmm. I, I quit after like four months, you know, Yeah, it wasn't for me. Now that's not to say you can't be passionate about running a septic company. If you're like, we are going to be there in somebody's moment of need. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, like that's great. But like, I know he didn't get an MBA wanting to run a septic company. (laughs) That wasn't his dream. (laughs) But it was a great opportunity for him. So maybe, maybe he does have passion behind it now, but uh, at least for me, that has driven me through a lot of the challenges that I faced. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, I want to go back. You mentioned one of your biggest challenges growing your business was, you know, getting the right people yeah. and bringing the right people in. What other kind of issues did you face? And and more specifically, I, I think what I'm, I want to know about is, was there ever a moment where you were like, oh, crap, I don't know what I'm doing here? <laughs> At Frontier Credit Union, we offer startup loans for emerging businesses to help support you in the early stages of growth. This could be for inventory, equipment, or other operating expenses. Almost all businesses qualify. Get started today by visiting our site, FrontierCreditUnion.com, federally insured by the NCUA. You mentioned one of your biggest challenges growing your business was, you know, getting the right people and bringing the right people in. What other kind of issues did you face? And, and more specifically, I, I think what I'm, I want to know about is, was there ever a moment where you were like, oh, crap, I don't know what I'm doing here? I mean, professionally, I feel like I know what I'm doing. Yeah, clearly you're um, very good at what you do. Yeah. And, and so I, I do think that there have been moments where um, employees have been unhappy. Mm-hmm. And at first it was difficult for me to understand why. Mm. Um, you know, an encounter with a patient happened and they got riled up. And we had the we had the option that we could discharge this patient from the practice, meaning refuse to see them again. Yeah. And I really saw the the confrontation that happened as some it it seemed like a joke to me. It seemed like an old guy who um, just said something crass and did not mean for it to be offensive. Yeah, sure. You know, and I've taken care of a lot of, you know, wonderful elderly people, veterans, you know, and, and they just. They have different life experiences, yeah, yeah, that's right. but it was very offensive to this employee. And ultimately, um, the employee then turns in their two week notice. And, and I was surprised. And really, it came down to the fact that we chose to continue to take care of that patient. And that was surprising to me because I was like, oh, we're all in on this together. Like, we're just here for the patients. And I, I didn't fully appreciate the way that my employee felt in that mm. moment. And I've learned from that experience that I, that I need to be more understanding of those kinds of circumstances mm-hmm. when um, an employee is, you know, it, it wasn't a threat at the employee, but it was um, maybe, uh, I mean, it was disrespectful. Yeah. 
it was disrespectful to the employee and um i didn't fully appreciate it yeah because i thought like it's just an old guy saying something that sometimes old guys say yeah so yeah that's interesting we had actually at the credit union i don't know it's been a little while now maybe six or nine months something like that we had um we had one of our members come in and say something um <laughs> racist to yeah. to one of our branch managers mm -hmm. and um I remember we got together as like a senior team. We're like, what do we do with this? And and our chief operating officer named Cindy High, she was like, that's not something that I feel comfortable with. And and when I asked her, like, what is it about it that's bothering you? Just trying to understand a little bit more. She's like, we can't let our employees feel unsafe when they're in, yeah. in you know, service of this organization. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, Cindy called this member and was like, "Sorry, you're out." Yeah, and you don't, you can't bank here anymore. And uh, I, I, I've always respected Cindy, but when when that happened, I was like, "Wow, that was like," and she was so clear cut about it. She's yeah. like, "This is the right thing to do." Right. And so that's what we're gonna do here. Yeah. And just my respect for her grew just a little bit more right. through that experience. But yeah, I I think that's a great example and. You know, I, I felt between a rock and a hard place in this experience because this particular patient, we had now diagnosed a cancer on them that yeah. needed to be treated. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, I could face legal repercussions if I discharge a patient with an untreated cancer. Yeah. Am I abandoning them? Sure. Like, and so, you know, ultimately, I don't know that there was a, a perfect answer to that situation. There never is. Yeah. Um, but I was sad to lose that employee. Yeah. So. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Those are so hard because you're right. It's like, what is the perfect response here it yeah. probably just doesn't exist yeah right there's no situation where everybody wins there no yeah that's tough um okay i have to know <laughs> you have to have the best stories about <laughs> stuff that you see at the practice yeah what is like the weirdest thing that you've dealt with as a dermatologist oh <laughs> I mean, there's, there's so many little funny ones. Thankfully we don't <laughs> deal with a lot of life and death. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember when I was a, a student, I was rotating at a program and the resident went in to see a patient and then came out very quickly to grab the doctor. Like this patient has, um, melanoma on their foot. Mm -hmm. Like this looks awful. It looks yeah. terrible. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to go in and look at this. Like, you know, it was melanoma on the foot and the doctor comes in. Um, Dr. Cleaver, great guy. And he walks in and he's great name for a yeah, doctor. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> he sits down on the stool and he gets up and he, you know, tips his glasses down and he looks at the bottom of the foot and he goes, lick. And it was like a chocolate chip that they <laughs> stepped on. <laughs> That's great. That's <laughs> pretty good. Uh, so it would be great if he just if he, yeah, licked, licked it, licked it and, you yeah. know. Pulled the, <laughs> hmm. Semi sweet. <laughs> Interesting. Like Bill Murray and Caddyshack yeah, with right. the, the candy bar. <laughs> that's right. Oh, so, but, um, you know, hospital consults got called in for a melanoma, which is a weird consult because if you think a patient has skin cancer, it's not usually like emergency going to work. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, but I'm a resident. I don't get to say no right. to consults. <laughs> right. so I was like, I have to show up. Yeah. And so, and it says melanoma on scalp. And I, I walk in and the patient is, you know, not in good shape. And I look and their scalp is totally black. Mm. And it was like, that's weird. And they had very little hair. And it was a woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, this just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and they're like barely conscious. So I just, I go and I get an alcohol swab and I just go to the top of their head and I just rub it. And after like two seconds, like I see their scalp. And so this person was using topical fibers to make it look like they had hair oh and goodness. they just never washed their scalp. Oh my gosh. Oh my so they just been putting like layers and layers oh. of these black fibers and somebody just looked at them and thought like, this ain't normal. It must be skin cancer. I'm going to get the resident. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, I just was like, you know, and it was like late at night. I had to leave the house, and so I just <laughs> throw the alcohol swab away. It's like, can't believe I have to write a consult note <laughs> <laughs> about wiping this off with an alcohol swab. That's hilarious. <laughs> so, oh my goodness. Okay, so I have a dermatologist story. Yeah. Um, so I ha actually on my hand here, I have this mole in between these two fingers, mm -hmm. and you probably can't see it. I'm not asking you for a consult <laughs> here. Yeah, I just so uh, this was probably I don't know six or seven years ago. Yeah. So I'm like I just and it it grew there mm -hmm. right like I didn't have it most of my life and then it appeared and mm -hmm. I was like 
I'm just gonna I'm just gonna have him look at it and just see what it is. And so I go I go into the dermatologist, and he's a, a guy like my age, you know, mm-hmm. like it's like if I went to you, yeah. right? And, um, and he's like, okay, yeah, you know, looks fine. I think you'd be all right. Um, he's like, do you want me to look at anything else? And I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> it's a little uncomfortable, but it's like, yeah, I've got moles all over my body. Yeah. If you want to look at it, he's like, let's look at all of them. And I'm like, all right, that sounds good. And he's like, he's like, why don't you go ahead and uh, get undressed, mm-hmm. and we'll just look at everything. And I'm like, that's great. And he's like, I have a, um, I don't know, a student or a resident. I don't know what. I'm not sure the terminology, yeah. but uh, that's in training. Do you mind if they come in and observe? And I'm. I'm pretty, you know, self-confident. And I'm like, sure, right. that's no big deal. And, yeah. And so he's like, okay, go ahead. We'll, I'll be back in a second. And he comes back with this beautiful young woman. <laughs> 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 and my pasty body, you know, out in the open for God and everybody to see. And uh, it was one of the more uncomfortable experiences I've had <laughs> at the doctor's <laughs> Because he's like, he's like, okay, this one, come get a closer look at this one right here. And I'm just like, oh my God, this is my fault. I said yes. I said, I said yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm fine, by the way. Thanks Good. for asking. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm um, nice to hear that. <laughs> Goodness. What's the one skincare product you're like, everyone should have this? Mm, I, it's an easy answer. It has to be sunscreen. I mean, mm. there's there's nothing that'll do more for anti-aging than protecting yourself from the sun. So um, it, it's not even close with any other product. What brand? Mm-hmm. I, I use a lot of different brands because I just, I try so many, but the most consistent sunscreen that I use is called Mantle, um, M-A-N-T-L. It's a, a gel sunscreen made for men so it doesn't gunk up in my facial hair. Yes. And I will, like uh, conflict of interest, I am an, an owner in the company. I own a small percentage of the company. Mm-hmm. I bought into it after using it for three years because I loved it. So yeah. I didn't start the brand, but I loved it so much I gave him some money. So cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I know Andrea, who's sitting here in the corner, <laughs> she's always like, okay, did everybody put on their sunscreen? <laughs> like, oh, we're just going to lunch. We don't need it. She's like, you're going to want to gonna wanna slick up here before you get out there in that sun. So. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I've seen your video on Ozempic. Yeah. But it's obviously a hot topic right sure. now. Yeah. Um, tell us more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, Ozempic is a is a great drug. Like it's doing something that we have looked for in medicine for a long time is to really help people lose weight. But it is not without potential side effects. Just I mean, you can't. There's no free lunch. Yeah. You're going to have potential consequences with just about anything that mm-hmm. you can do. And what I think that we have seen is that it's really effective for some people to jumpstart their weight loss journey. It was first approved for type 2 diabetes, and then it was approved for weight loss, and now we have Tirzepatide or Manjaro as a competitor for that. And it's probably even more effective for weight loss. But it really has highlighted the importance that um, you still must be physically active if you're trying to lose weight. Because when your body goes into this mode of starvation, ultimately it still comes down to you must burn more calories than you consume in order to lose weight. But your bodily functions need a certain basal metabolic rate of nutrients every day. You need so much protein, carbohydrates, and fat to function. And if you're not taking that in, it's going to find it from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so what we have seen is that people may use these medications to jumpstart their weight loss, but if they're not really proactive in physical activity, they're going to start stealing protein from their muscles. Mm -hmm. They're going to start stealing minerals from their bones. And so we're seeing people, they may lose 40 pounds, but it may only be 20 pounds of fat and it may be five pounds of bone and Mm -hmm. uh, 10 pounds of muscle or something like that. So um, you can get sarcopenic or muscle wasting and you can get osteopenic or bone wasting if you're not doing resistance training Mm. and cardiovascular work to maintain that. So uh, there's also been problems with people getting uh, called gastroparesis where it slows down how frequently and how fast your stomach empties the food. Mm. And that's why you feel fuller longer. But if you paralyze your stomach with this peptide, um, some people the stomach doesn't start working as well as it did before. Oh, interesting. And so you can Mm. get gastroparesis where now you have 
persistent nausea because that food is just sitting there in the stomach. It's not getting into the intestines. You're not absorbing those nutrients and people can get backed up and wow, some people got diarrhea. So there's, there's still, you know, the best thing that you can do is move your body more and eat less, but that's not going to be perfect for everybody. Our food system and the way that we've lived for decades now, so many people are just metabolically broken and their body doesn't know how to process those nutrients properly. So it can still be a good drug to get somebody going on the right track. Um, but it should not be done in my opinion, without, uh, putting in some of that other work too. And you can start slow, but you got to start. Mm. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Hey, it's, it's a weird one cause you hear about it all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but I feel like at least the general public, like we don't really know anything about, yeah. <laughs> about it. I don't think. No. And, uh, but we're just like, it's the miracle that we've always wanted it to right. be. Right. Yeah. So it's that, that's an interesting one. So in what scenario would you say, do not take this? I know this is hard for you to say in a generalized way, but yeah. Yeah. And I will give the disclaimer. I I've never prescribed right. this. It's yeah. not within my scope of practice. Sure. It's just, yeah. I've seen a lot of patients that are taking it. I wanted to learn more. So I did some reading on that. Yeah. But, you know, if, if you are facing incredible health challenges because of your weight, then it's probably important for you to do it. And I think the benefits will outweigh the risks. Mm -hmm. But um, I have seen people who just wanted to lose five or 10 pounds uh, because they are, uh, you know, a wine mom and they drink too much wine. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, I just want to be skinnier for summer. That's right. And uh, I was like, that is not an appropriate That's, way to use this. Yeah. You know, you're yeah. getting medicine that should be going to someone else right. and you're risking side effects. And so it's, it's not just to lose five pounds so you look better in a bathing suit. It's to lose 50 or more pounds because you are metabolically broken. Yeah. You are suffering from hypertension. You have high cholesterol. Yeah. You're at risk for heart disease. Because it's medically necessary yes. for you. Yeah. 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 Well, I guess that's true of all medicines, I, I suppose. Yeah. Huh? Well, sorry, everybody. <laughs> yeah. We ruined it for you. Yeah. Yeah. So with such a large audience, obviously, when you go out in public, people recognize you. Um, how often do, do you have any weird stories about that? Uh, it, I mean, it hasn't happened that often. Um, so I thought it might happen more often. And I was like, oh, you know, like I'll be with other derms and like they get recognized. Um, you feel bad. <laughs> so I was like, what about me? Dude? Yeah, I'll take your picture. <laughs> no, Are but, you ever like, do you know how much more famous I am than that guy? Come on. No, he's, he's more famous than I am. He's got more followers. But, oh, um, but, uh, you know, ultimately, like, I don't I don't care. Um, and so it's funny, like, when that kind of stuff happens. But I've been recognized in weird places, like, it's just a random bathroom. Starbucks. Oh, and, no, not a, not a bathroom, thankfully. <laughs> like, it's a weird place to strike up a conversation. Sure is. Um, but, you know, occasionally, just randomly here and there, like, random Starbucks. I've had a, a couple times at Starbucks. Uh, maybe the baristas are all on TikTok, so. <laughs> they probably They are. see it more commonly. Yeah, that's probably true. Um, and, and then I was at a dermatology conference, and I was just in line to go in, and um, another dermatologist from, from another country, they turned around and, and they just looked at me and like, oh, you're famous. famous. <laughs> and I'm like, no. I'm like, I'm just a derm. You're a derm. Like, you know, so it, do it's you, funny. Do you ever feel like you're famous? Um, like, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's the question. It's a weird question. Yeah, no, I really don't. Yeah. Um, my wife keeps me humble that way. She, <laughs> she hates social media. Um, I do like to like that my kids think it's cool. Yeah. Like, so at least they still think I'm cool. Like yeah. if I get a TikTok sweatshirt good. or something, like I'll give it to my son. He wears it to school and he, like people think that's cool. So um, I've enjoyed really cool experiences yeah. and I feel like it's famous adjacent, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like getting to go on the talk on, you know, uh, sit there with Jerry O'Connell and, um, and, and just talk about different things on national TV. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Or, or me yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. This is number one on the list. <laughs> Um, you know, and meet, you know, some big YouTubers and other big TikTokers that, you know, that's been pretty cool and, um, should be filming a, a national TV commercial here in another month. Wow, so I'm cool. excited about that. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. That is kind of neat. Do you have a social media platform that's your favorite? Is it TikTok? Um, 
I would I would have used to say it's TikTok, but I feel like the algorithm has changed so much. Mm -hmm. Like the rate at which your videos go viral is less. So I think more consistently on Instagram, uh, you you just get more consistency out of the platform. So I I tend to favor that right now. Mm -hmm. um, I would really love to see my YouTube grow and have plans to try to make that happen. But um, right now, Instagram is probably the one that I spend the most time on. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's next for your practice? What, what's on the horizon? Yeah. So I am really excited about this project. So when I was in medical school, um, one of the other clubs that I was in, in addition to ER <laughs> and Durham, was the, it's called Homeless Camp Outreach. And oh, wow. So on Sundays. I was in like the pizza eating club. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> these are cool too. Yeah. So on Sundays, I would, uh, they would go every week. Uh, my wife would let me go like once a month. Um, and so we would go and usually fill up a couple big carafes of coffee, mm -hmm. grab a couple pallets of water, um, batteries, socks, uh, pet food. And we would go to where the homeless people lived in Des Moines because um, they had little encampments. And we'd go and we'd take them hot coffee and water and pet food and batteries and clean socks and just strike up a conversation and talk to them. And I, I just really enjoyed the experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and just saw the humanity of these people that we sometimes other. And then about once a quarter, the med school had a big motor home that they would um, allow us to come with them. And we would go do medication refills for the, the homeless uh, population. Oh, that was the first time I got to do you know a physical exam on a real patient, listen to the heart and lungs and talk to the doctor about what medications they needed refilled. And and so I always thought I'd love to do something like that someday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with the success that I've enjoyed on social media and been able to make some more income from that, I took a lot of that and bought a motor home last year. Mm. And we've had it converted, like gutted, turned into a mobile clinic. It's just about done over at Bish's right now. Um, we just talked to Lupo Motors. They're gonna wrap it in graphics and we're gonna get sponsors, hopefully. Um, we've gotten some, we're trying to get more sponsors because it's ridiculously expensive, <laughs> but I want to go out and I just want to do free dermatology care as much as possible. Mm. Cool. So we're going to do a lot of free skin cancer screenings, mm -hmm. um, in the local area, corporate events and everything. But I really want to go to rural Idaho. Mm -hmm. I want to go somewhere where it's four hours for them to see a derm. Yeah. And what if we could go there and coordinate with a family doc and see 40 patients in a day? That's great. And, and then teach that family doc what they need to do to follow up with these patients. And we'll film a lot of it for social media. Mm -hmm. uh, very careful with patient consent, of course. Of Nobody's going to yeah. be forced to be on camera in order to get medical care. But I want to showcase what we can do in dermatology to change lives. It's not just pimple popping. It's not just Botox. But when patients have horrible acne, psoriasis, eczema, we have medicines that can change their life. And I think it's important to showcase that not only for, you know, social media, but because there's somebody else out there who doesn't know there's an option mm -hmm. that might have that condition. And if we can reach them, then um, that would be a fantastic opportunity to educate them and to educate family doctors that we can partner with. So um, in the next... Uh, you know, hopefully six to eight weeks, we're going to have that completed. Wow. And I hope to start hosting free skin cancer screenings. I will partner with other derms in the area because um, I, I don't want this to look like it's just a marketing thing for my practice. Yeah, mm. my logo is going to be on the side and we're going to go out. But if any dermatologist anywhere in the state wants to join us for something, they can do that and they can share their practice information. And we want to do a lot of good. Yeah, it's really cool. I think that's wonderful. You know, it's interesting as you're talking about that and talking about some of these rural communities, mm -hmm. and you're from one of them, yeah. right? And um, our credit union is built largely around rural Idaho. Mm -hmm. Like we have branches in Salmon and Chalice and Arco and Shelley and, yeah. you know, these kind of outlying communities where. Um, there's not a lot of services that you get like here in the Treasure Valley where we're at today. Right. Um, and I'm going to say this right here on this podcast. We'd like to sponsor that. <laughs> Heck yeah. um, that I project. think it could be really synergistic <laughs> yeah. because uh, you guys have parking lots in we different do. locations. We absolutely and do. And yeah. we could park a motorhome in there uh -huh. and host an event where we just do free skin cancer screenings. Because I know the day is going to come and we're going to be able to put it on social media where a uh, 
thirty year old mother of three comes in and we catch a melanoma early yeah. and we save their life. Yeah. And that wouldn't have happened without what we do. And we can't do it for everybody, but I hope it can inspire other people to do this kind of thing too. Because right. it takes money, but it's not that hard to do. Right. So Yeah. We're in. We're in. Yeah. Oh, we'll <laughs> have to talk off off <laughs> air and discuss it. But, but, but yeah. 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 I want to go to as many rural communities as we can. My mom grew up in Arco, mm -hmm. you know, wow. all, all over yeah. southeast Idaho. Yeah. You know, I played sports and, and stuff. So I I know people in these communities. Right. And um, I, I want to go serve. Yeah. Really so. cool. Gosh, I love that. Yeah. Dang. What's your message to the world? <laughs> <laughs> um, talk to people like the world's so crazy right now. And I have, I, I think I'm in a privileged position that we have, we're, we're in a very red state mm -hmm. when we start talking politics and a lot of the patients that are from this area, they come in and they're wearing their MAGA hat mm -hmm. and, they're um, they're just mad right now, and I have a great conversation with them, mm. and I understand their frustrations. And then we have the California migrant who comes up, and they've got their Biden Harris you know hat on, <laughs> and they have concerns and they're worried about the future. And I have a great conversation with mm -hmm. them, and I think if we can get more people just talking to people and trying to be understanding will solve a lot of problems because what you see on social media and what you see on the news is not the real world. Mm -hmm. And we need more people to just have conversations and try to be understanding because I think we're a lot more similar than we are different. And the, the media machine drives clicks and views and revenue by polarizing us. Mm -hmm. But I get the privilege to take care of some of the best people in Idaho right there in my mm -hmm. clinic of all walks of life, of political persuasions, of gender ideologies, of, um, you know, ec socioeconomic status. And it, it, I just, it's a privilege to take care of all of them. Yeah. And I feel like these are good people and I could turn to them if I needed something, mm -hmm. you know, that they have expertise in and they'd be happy to do that for anybody. And we need more people to understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, it's, this is a good one. It's, it's a really real good, good one. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, actually before you got here we were having a conversation <laughs> <laughs> and um it, it's a stupid topic actually it's a really <laughs> dumb topic and it's like is it okay for your neighbor's kids to like play in your driveway right right and um bailey and i were talking about it and you know i grew up in texas where mm -hmm. we have a certain kind of cultural viewpoint on that and bailey grew up in california where they have a different kind of cultural viewpoint on that we both live in Idaho now, so mm -hmm. we've been influenced by the local Idahoan, you know, cultural view of that. It's a dumb topic, but what we found, and we thought right at first that we really disagreed with one another, yeah. actually. And as we talked through it more and more and more, we realized we, the, the amount of difference mm -hmm. is like maybe 1%. Yeah. And everything else is pretty well aligned on that. And I think that does happen a lot yeah. in our world. We get hung up over 1% of difference mm -hmm. instead of focusing on 99% where we see totally eye to eye on yep. things. 100%. Yeah. It's a great one. Yeah. Is it's there good. anything else? Would, did we miss anything? Is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't talk about? Um, no. I, I think we've covered a lot of stuff. And, and just I just think anybody can do just about anything they want if they just stick with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've been lucky. I've been blessed. I've got great family. I've got great employees. But... Like, I just know that I'm determined to succeed regardless of the circumstances. Yeah. And I think that taking that attitude and applying it into your own life, you'll you'll do amazing things. Yeah. Thank good. you. That's great. Really That's great. Okay. I have a dumb one. Oh, boy. Here we go. <laughs> I know nothing about this, so maybe this is a dumb question. No, but... this is going to be great. I can <laughs> tell already. Botox or Dysport? Um, you know, they're they're all the same pretty much okay so if you like one over the other i don't carry disport but it's just because i don't want to keep track of inventory of five different neuromodulators in my practice so we have botox and zeeman so we used to have disport but then i was like why am i buying three different things you know so okay people love it it's great I, i'm not strongly in favor of one or the other what do, I don't need, uh, what are we talking about? I don't I've heard of Botox. I don't know anything else you just said though. Yeah. <laughs> what is what is this about? They're they're competitors. So oh, they, so Botox mm -hmm. is like a brand. That's a brand name. It's oh, like I had Kleenex. No idea. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, 
Yeah, it's a brand name, but there's other competing brands that do the same do the thing. same thing. Yeah. Okay, interesting. It's like really confusing on social media because I feel like all you used to ever hear was Botox, and so yeah. when people started talking mm-hmm. about Dysport, you're like, what? Yeah. And is it different? And so, yeah. yeah. It's just kind of confusing. Interesting. The differences are usually going to be in the injector and their skill. Mm. So, oh, interesting. Okay, very interesting. How do you know that somebody is a bad injector? <sighs> you get injected poorly. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's the What's surefire. The red flag, right? okay? I mean, if if their clients look like they had a stroke for three months, <laughs> then something went wrong. <laughs> fair. That's fair. That makes sense. Oh, boy. So. Do you ever have somebody come in and they're just and they look like they had a stroke? Yeah. And they're like, "You got to fix me. Whatever yeah. happened That's here?" Fine. Right. Oof. Yeah. No, it's definitely happened. And with Botox, once it's in there, it's in there, and you just have to wait for it to wear off. Yeah. yeah. So if your eyelid is like doing this, um, <laughs> terrifying. Just wait a couple just months. Just stay home for <laughs> a few months. months. Yeah. You know. How often so. do you have to like turn down people because they want Botox before they can get more Botox? Oh, not often. I mean, I, th- I think most people are pretty well versed on, on Botox now. I think a lot of people don't understand what Botox does, though. And they'll come in and be like, oh, I don't like these lines here mm-hmm. on my mouth. Can you give me Botox? I'm like, Botox won't do anything for that. Like, you need a filler. It's going to fill those lines. Botox is just going to relax the muscles here. But it's not going to give you the volume there so mm. there's just an education gap on that but interesting um people come in wanting more filler when they don't need more filler but not too many people are like i can't move my face can i have more botox <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> that totally makes sense. How, how often do you have people come in for maybe cosmetic reasons mm-hmm. versus medical reasons yeah so we have we've geared our practice to be the top tier medical dermatology practice yeah. in the valley yeah that is where we're going to serve the most patients and so we do offer cosmetic services sure i like doing botox i like doing laser cases i personally don't enjoy doing fillers so i don't advertise it i haven't taken a new filler patient in like two and a half years oh, i just wow. treat my old patients uh, perhaps we'll hire somebody that loves to do injections someday but um, our bread and butter is medical dermatology finding skin cancer and then treating skin cancer surgically the way that we built our new clinic building uh, was just around that ideal and we have the cosmetic services that we like to offer to our existing patients yeah but we are not trying to go out and be the top tier recruiter of cosmetic patients Mm -hmm. so when you say fillers that the lip the lip thing do Mm -hmm. you do that anywhere else or is it just lips so you can do lips i've done temples um, oh cheekbones, uh, marionette oh. lines, smile lines, all of that kind of interesting. stuff. Interesting. I've done filler in hands when people's oh, really? skin gets really thin, yeah. Oh, oh interesting. I never, never thought even of that. considered that. Mm-hmm. So if you have like bony mm-hmm. hands, yep. you can give a little more volume under the skin there. And interesting. interesting. So I will say I I'm curious what you think. Like I think the lip filler looks awful on a woman. <laughs> but <laughs> I think it's like really bad. <laughs> yeah. But the good ones you don't notice. That's probably yes. true. So that's probably true. It's true. Yeah. It's the yeah. people that get like addicted and like keep getting more and more and more. Yeah. And yeah. it's just not a natural look. Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh. That's a good point. Yeah. All right. When we get done, I want you to show me a picture of like a good one. Because I'm cur- I'm curious if, you know, what I what yeah. I think about that. Because you see it every now and again, you're just like, oh boy, that's not good. Yeah. That's not- I mean, I would I would venture to say Think of any celebrity woman over 50 who's still considered just a natural beauty. Oh. That's good Botox and filler. Mm. Oh. <laughs> That's so true. That's You're good. probably right. I hadn't considered that. All right. I know what it, what I'm going to be doing all night is looking. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my I'm just gosh. Joking. All right. Did we miss anything else? Anything else we got to talk about? Some great stuff. All right. Well, this was awesome. Yeah, Thank was you. A lot of fun. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Uh, I'm really, really excited to work with you guys in the future. Yeah. And thank you for joining us on the Dragon Slayer podcast by Frontier Credit Union. We'll see you next time. Woo! All right. That was great. That was fun. That was one of the rare ones that got um, pros or. Pre- charges pressed for toilet papering a house. No way. Yes. That's oh hilarious. We were just talking about TBing yeah. people. Yeah. Just, just earlier <laughs> today, we were talking about that. Yeah. I uh, I gave a speech yesterday at, uh-huh. at an event, and one of the things I talked about was 
like stuff that I did as a teenager uh-huh. that I shouldn't have been doing. <laughs> and I was telling, I think maybe both of you yesterday, uh, I had a friend. So I grew up in Texas. Yeah. And I had a friend who had caught a bunch of possums. Okay. He was like live trapping them on their property to just like relocate them, get rid of them. Yeah. And anyway, one day he's like, hey, I got a great idea. And <laughs> I like where this is going. Well, any. <laughs> This is one of those friends that you're just like, anytime he says something like that, you know it's the worst possible idea, Yeah. but you know it's going to be a good time anyway. Absolutely. Right? And so anyway, he's like, yeah, we could take the possum, they're alive, yeah. and we could put them in people's houses. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, that sounds amazing. Let's do that. Uh-huh. And so we go one night and we're just, first we start with like our friends' houses, Doors are locked, whatever. We get kind of done through our friends' houses, and we're and then we just start going to random people, and we're we're like trying their doors, and a lot of them are open, and we're just chucking a possum in there, closing the door and leaving, and it was all fun and games until, apparently, maybe this is just a Texas thing, but when you you break into somebody's home, to put a possum in there. Apparently that's against the law. They don't want you doing that. <laughs> I, I would not have guessed. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, the police brought me home. I'm yeah. like 16, something like that. 17, maybe something. But you know, I would be terrified to open a door in Texas. <laughs> it's a good point. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think they're pretty pro 2A down there. Pre- yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I think the, uh, the like one of the stats on on firearms is. Like how many firearms per person? Yeah, and most states are like, oh, there's like 0.5 firearms per person. Yeah. In Texas, it's like 12 firearms per, per person. person. Yeah, <laughs> it's like really, really high. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think that one through. But... We were young and yeah, we were real dumb on that one. It's a good time though. Mm-hmm. <laughs>